You're listening to The Bouquet Toss, the podcast that helps you plan your day your way by helping you figure out what to keep and what to toss from your wedding day plans. This season on The Bouquet Toss, we are both posing and attempting to answer the question, why weddings? For most of us, a wedding is something we view as a rite of passage, filled with traditions that we associate with the celebration that often we might not understand or really know the history behind. So naturally, there's a lot of questions when it comes to why we do weddings the way that we do. It's one of the most formal events most of us participate in in our entire lives, and there seems to be so many unspoken rules that we come to learn by attending other weddings before planning our own. These questions can infiltrate almost every aspect of planning a wedding, and it seems so hard to find a one-size-fits-all answer to any of it. But at the end of the day, you get to choose the rules that you follow. I always want to say you have the freedom to take the pressure off and that there's no rules. I love being able to say there's no rules. But I know we, myself included, (laughs) will still inevitably search for a guide to help us navigate the mystery around wedding etiquette. There's just so many things that feel like we, we don't know. So we are thrilled to bring on today's guest to help us demystify all of the stressful etiquette questions that come with wedding planning. With us today, we have Mariah Grimet. Mariah wrote an entire book on modern wedding etiquette called What Do I Do? What a perfect name. <laughs> so cute. She, she's the founder and instructor at Old Soul Etiquette and has made appearances on The Today Show, NBC News, and more. We're so excited to have you. Welcome, Mariah. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here with you both today. Yes. First of all, I love your sweater with the pearls on it. I need oh, to say that. I just <laughs> bought it yesterday. <gasps> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so before we get started, you know, we're going to dive into a lot of juicy questions that we have for you. But before we do, I want to know, like, how did you get started teaching etiquette? <laughs> it's a unique niche, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> so it's been something I've been interested in since I was a teen. But usually just it it was self-study, something I would read about or ask questions about or go to special exhibits at museums, just a self-interest of mine. So when I moved to New York City after college to start working in the fashion industry, I was looking for things to do on the weekends to meet like-minded people. And so I ended up signing up for my first etiquette course. That was my very first course I, I took. I was an adult. I didn't take any etiquette courses as a child. And so I took this course in New York on the weekend and I had a total gut feeling, as you would call it, that I, I think I'm missing my calling. And so it was a, uh, a passion turned business and I'm, I'm so grateful for that. That's I love so that so cool. much. I wanna ask a quick question actually, just a tangent, but where did you grow up? I grew up in New Jersey. So moving to New York City was not a, a big thing. I, I grew up under 40 miles outside of Manhattan. So this was our city growing up, but it was my my first big move out of the house after college. Very cool. Yeah, the only reason I was curious about that is because I grew up in the South and mm-hmm. we went to etiquette classes as young girls. Like I think I was maybe eight years old when I went to a course called White Gloves and Party Manners. <laughs> and so that's <laughs> like my frame of reference for everything when it comes to etiquette. So it's just- Well, it, it's funny. Most people will assume, oh, you grew up in such a formal household. You must have done cotillion and grew up doing etic- or taking etiquette classes. And people are surprised when I say I did not take a formal course until after I graduated college. Very cool. I love that. I I'm just so curious, like when it comes to something like etiquette, you know, you've taken courses, you've done research, what becomes an authority on something like etiquette? It seems like it could be such a subjective thing, like based on where you grew up or traditions you've learned, or I don't even know, like what, how, can you just talk about that? Sure. That's a great, that's a great question. And you're certainly correct that a lot of it is subjective. And I like to say too, that etiquette evolves as our world does. So things that people learned a week ago, a year ago, pre-pandemic, I mean, things are, are constantly changing. I have taken specific certification courses with very reputable protocol schools that have, I guess, I don't know if I like the word authority, but have given me the, what I think is the, you know, the place to be able to teach to other people versus classes just to be more educated or learn. So that's how I differentiate from, you know, my self-studies and the 
thousand books that are on my bookshelf right now that I've read versus the actual training courses that I've taken that gets down to the real history of it um, and the why. But I, I agree with you completely that it's it's so situational. And so that's why I really teach from a practical standpoint and from a modern standpoint, because things evolve in the same way that any type of learning does. Yeah. I would also love to hear like your take on what you feel like the definition of etiquette is. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm used to all the pushback in the world. People have <laughs> really preconceived notions about what etiquette is. And the way I define it is making intentional decisions to be mindful of other people's needs. I'm so glad that we, we asked that and that you said that because that, I think, is literally what wedding planning is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Even like, you know, our whole podcast at the Bouquet Toss is literally about like, do you, your wedding, your way. Right. And I think we get so caught up. I mean, I'm planning my wedding right now. Like Me too. Oh my God, <laughs> when are you getting married? Uh, next November. Awesome. Um, and so, you know, you get so tripped up, like, what am I supposed to do? Or, you know, is this the way it goes? And that's because tradition is all wrapped up in it the same way it is with etiquette. Mm-hmm. And at some level, I would love for us all to believe our wedding can be whatever we want it to be. But at the same time, by having a wedding, we are subscribing to this established rite of passage, ceremony, ritual, where, you know, we're partaking in that thing. And so I think inevitably, we have to think about and be mindful of how what we're doing impacts others. That was really the the driving force behind the message of my book was, you know, answering the questions of like, what do I do in all these crazy wedding planning situations? But it's more so the fact that let's let's respect the tradition. Let's learn the why behind why we do the things that we do so that we can modernize the how. Because I agree with you. Etiquette is about being mindful of other people's needs and being considerate to others, but without compromising our own boundaries and our own vision. It's, it's a balancing, it's a juggling act to balance it all. But that was really the driving force behind behind the book. I feel like the most common conversations that I'm seeing happening around etiquette these days are fueled by, you know, Reddit threads of like, am I the (laughs) a-hole in this situation about a wedding? Mm -hmm. And ultimately, like a lot of those questions are rooted in what is the etiquette in this situation? Who's in the right? Who's in the wrong? And so this etiquette situation is like such an important conversation to bring it into these modern times. Yeah. I think let's just get started with talking about some of the like really popular questions that we have heard. Um, I think the thing that's standing out to me the most is kids or no kids. Mm. I will say that that is completely, completely up to the couple and they should be okay with whatever decision that they want to make. It also depends on on family situations. Like I think about me, I'm the oldest sibling, I'm the oldest grandchildren. There are no young children in my family yet. And so for me, it's not an issue. But I think I would feel a lot differently if I had I'm super close to my sister and brother. So if my sister or brother had children, I may think, you know, feel very differently about that. So I leave that up to the to the couple. Uh, but I would just say if you are having a child free wedding, to just make sure you're communicating that politely either through your wedding website or an extra information card in your invitation, or perhaps just making sure that your envelopes are addressed properly. Yes, it is completely up to the couple. And the etiquette part of it is not whether or not you're having the kids there. The etiquette part is how you're communicating, whatever it is that you decide. 100%. I will always, always say that so much about proper etiquette and good manners and all that stuff has to do with your delivery and how you communicate these boundaries. Because again, we're not compromising our boundaries to make other people happy. We're making our own decisions, but we're communicating it in a way that's clear and fair and polite. There's also the added layer to you can communicate it as thoroughly and as kindly and as thoughtfully through your wedding website or these various other ways. But what if those guests come to you asking about it anyway? Like, oh, I saw this is on your website, but what about me? How do you advise couples to handle those conversations and those situations with tact and kindness and respect and like boundaries? And maybe this is a question that's crossing more into like therapy than than etiquette, but. I always call myself a completely 
untrained, unlicensed therapist. But that's, <laughs> perfect, that's okay. Perfect. Go for it. <laughs> it, com- it comes with the territory. It comes with the discussion. So anytime I use, and this is not my term that I coined, but the the sandwich effect when you either deliver difficult news or respond or tackle a difficult situation, you sandwich the negative part between two positives. So when someone comes to you and says, and this can be any pushback you get about anything regarding the wedding, but we'll use children as we're speaking about this. If someone comes to you and says, you know, I know you said no children, but you know, you're so close to my kids. They'd love to be there, blah, blah, blah. You start with a positive and you say, oh my gosh, you know how much your children mean to me. I wish we could have everyone there. Then you deliver the difficult news. Unfortunately, we just don't have the room, whatever it is, however you want to communicate it. And then you end it with another positive. You know, thankfully, we're going to have so many other things to celebrate coming up that we can include the children. Maybe we can even do something after the wedding so they can look at the pictures and feel like they were a part of it whatever you want to do, but you're sandwiching that no between two positive things. So it, it relieves the sting a little bit. Perfect. Love that. Yeah. I mean, that's directly related to the next one that we hear a lot, which is, do you have to invite your parents' friends? Mm-hmm. Which I think it's the same, it, no matter what, it's all going to be, I think you're going to say it's all pretty much up to the couple. Um, but it's how the information is delivered that really matters. You know, we get into the dicey territory sometimes with this of like, well, who's paying for them? Mm -hmm. And that's what I was going to say. I think something that's helpful for every couple to think about when there are people that are maybe being like asked by other family members to be added to the list. You have to, I think, decide for yourself kind of upfront. Is this going to be a situation where I know and like intimately have had conversations with every single person at my wedding. Jess brought up a great one on one of our recent episodes. Like, would you take that person out to dinner? Mm. And pay the bill. And if not, and pay the bill. (laughs) And if not, because that's what you're doing at your wedding, maybe they don't make it. But that's so nuanced because at the same time, your wedding is not just you and your partner. It's also for your families. This is a big, huge change. And this is a way for them to acknowledge that milestone and also kind of grieve the past and move into the future together. And if having their friends there is something that they really want for their experience of your wedding, then maybe it is important to have them there. It is really nuanced, as you mentioned. I I talk about something in my book called like the the balance of power over decisions especially when money is involved, who gets that say? Um, Because that's an easy way to say, well, we're paying, so we are going to have this. It is really about the communication and and communicating those expectations up front and saying, we really want to get married at this venue. This is how many people are on our guest list. Here's how many people I'm thinking. What does your list look like? Let's work together and make sure that everything is fitting in. It's a compromise for sure, but compromising and communicating the expectations up front are, are what will set you up for success. Yeah, this also applies to who gets a plus one. Mm. And I think people want there to be a rule. People want it to be like, if the person in question is engaged or living with a partner, then they have to be invited. Like people want there to be a hard and fast rule and there's just not. So what I always say here is first of all, you have to understand and define the difference between a plus one and a significant other. Hmm. Because they're different. A plus one is saying... This is an adult guest who is not in a committed relationship, so we are giving them the opportunity to bring someone along. That's a true plus one versus a relationship, which, as you mentioned, gets a little bit gray. Are they newly dating? Are they engaged? Do they live together? And that's where it gets very specific and situational, depending on your relationship with them and their relationship at the time. So it's it's hard. It's really difficult to give a hard and fast rule um, on that. But I would say the most important thing is to be consistent. So if you are giving your two friends a plus one, but you're not giving your fiance's work friends a plus one, that's where it becomes an issue for me from an etiquette standpoint. So you're either deciding we have the room to give every single adult a plus one for our wedding because that works for us, or we are only inviting couples who who live together or are engaged or married or you know life partners, whatever it may be, and we're not able to give single guests a plus one. So it's, I, I wish I could sit here and say, this is the rule, this is what's to follow. It's, it's so difficult to do that. And that's why I like to say there's no etiquette rules, there's etiquette guidelines, because there's always an exception and always a, a special situation for everyone. But I think the most important part 
or I know the most important part from an etiquette perspective is to be consistent once you make that decision. You want to be mindful of how someone would feel if they're the only one without a a, right. a plus one, especially if they're within a, a social circle that speaks to each other. Yeah, or if they maybe don't know anybody else. Right. They could be, uh, you know, a friend that you have that you don't have other mutual friends with. And to come somewhere alone where you don't know anyone is hard. Absolutely. And so, yeah, that is that is a great way to look at it. Absolutely. I think you've given some really great guidelines and, you know, just reiterating being consistent and communicating for sure. And it sounds so simple, right? Okay, yes, where I am communicating, right? <laughs> What's that going to do? But when you take a step back and slow down and really be intentional about how you're communicating and when and where, it really makes a difference when you put the effort into to setting that up ahead of time. Is yeah. a good place to put some of that stuff like a wedding website? Maybe not with plus one, but like with kids, like kids or no kids, I feel like I often see that on wedding websites where it's like, you know, we have decided that like it's just so that it's plain and there to see and everybody can see it kind of thing. You absolutely can. It can be something as, as simple as in the RSVP area if you're doing that through your website or on the event information. Like we love children, but we have chosen to have a child-free event, something as simple as that. Or oftentimes I see an extra card along with the invitation bundle that's just maybe accommodations and information and it may just be a, a bullet point there too. I would hope that people would be able to just read the envelope and realize if it doesn't say the Smith family, that the children right. are not invited, if it just, you know, says the adults, but you can never be too clear in your communication. Typically when you, you know, if you are a single person or, you know, even if you're in a relationship, but like you, you are the primary guest or friend or whatever of the couple who's being invited to the wedding, like it would say, and guest on your yes. invitation. And so that's like an indication for anyone listening and receiving invitations to know, do I get a plus one or not? Like, can I bring my boyfriend? It would say explicitly like either and your partner's name or and guest on your invitation, right? Yes. Exactly. So that's a great segue because for invitations and even I guess save the dates too, I think a question that is always asked is when do you send them? And like, how is that time frame even figured out? It, what, what would you say is the etiquette on that? Again, it's a guideline. I think if you're having a destination wedding, the timeline will always be a little bit longer just for obvious reasons. Um, but for a, a safe the date anywhere between, I know it's a, a broad range, but anywhere between six and 10 months, six and eight months is a, is a great way to do it. Up to a year in advance, I see a, a lot more nowadays, especially with destination weddings. And then an invitation can be anywhere from two to three months prior to the date. And is that just because that is what is most helpful for someone receiving it in terms of like them figuring out their timeline? Yes, it, it's it's for people, I know this sounds, sounds redundant, it's for people obviously to save the date right ahead of time. We're so over committed these days in our lives. So it's it's obviously for that reason. But it's also for the planning reason for the couple as they are navigating working with vendors and venues and having to gauge numbers and tables and, you know, all the way down to the detail of making sure the, the florist knows how many tables that are going to be. You don't have the exact number, but it is it's for a, a planning perspective on both ends. I'm in like a bunch of bride Facebook groups and like that's the thing everyone's always asking. There's like a million threads and it's always the same thing people recommend around two to three months, but it just seems like something everybody is so unclear about. And I mean, maybe it's just the anticipation, like you want to know who's coming right. and you kind of want to send it earlier, but. There's no, again, there's no rule that says you can't send it earlier. It's not completely necessary if you've already sent the save the date. And I think also with so many people using wedding websites, which not everyone does, you don't have to, of course, but with wedding websites being so common, it's like all the information is there from the beginning. Right. So I think there's less of a, less, or people are feel less pressure to get the physical invitations out sooner. Yeah. And it's another example of the more communication you have with your guests, the better off you're going to be. It's so true. And it is really too, again, how things evolve. Like etiquette books 15 years ago, we're not talking about wedding websites no, <laughs> that's right? a whole you know that's a whole new way that we communicate that our plan it changes Emily invitations Post's repertoire <laughs> right right it changes it really changes invitations it changes the way we communicate about accommodations about rsvps it, it changes everything really mm -hmm. 
Do you have an example of like what the time frame, maybe like 50 years ago, how it was different? Or you don't have to, it's just like a bonus if you know. <laughs> you know, I think that first of all, the the bells and whistles were not as common, right? All of the welcome parties and the transportation and all of these things that didn't have to be communicated to guests because they didn't exist. So it was, this is the wedding, here's the invitation, you can come or you can't come, here's the RSVP card, all of those things. Um, you know, back in the day, registries obviously were not done online. <laughs> so you had to figure out where someone was registered and go to the physical store to, to purchase something. And so it's definitely, it's definitely changed and, and yeah. social media and technology has, has certainly moved quickly. So we have to, to move with it. <laughs> yeah. And also people were marrying people that lived near them and mm. families lived more close together. You know, now again, with technology and everything like we're much more spread out people are meeting people that live much further away yes, and then point. marrying them and so there's just a million other uh, you know things to consider when actually getting everybody to the same place mm -hmm. definitely one point you just brought up mariah was about registries and this wasn't a question we originally had on our list but i'm curious to know because i feel like questions we get a lot or see a lot are about what is the appropriate amount to spend mm. on a wedding gift and how that might differ depending on if you're just a guest or if you're a member of the wedding party. Do you have any advice surrounding that? Yes, I, I don't like to give numbers because I think it's so specific, it's geographical, it depends on relationship. So I don't like to give a range because I number one, you can't give more than you can. That's first and foremost. Um, and you can't go with the old time saying, cover your plate because plates are way more expensive nowadays. So it's, and people are choosing to have different wedding styles. So it's, it's again, not easy to, to pick a hard and fast rule. But I think that, you know, when it comes to giving a gift, you need to consider what is your relationship with the person? Are you bringing a guest? Your guest should not be responsible for bringing their own gift. They are your guest. If you choose to do that together, that's you know your own decision, but you are responsible for giving the couple the gift. You know them, right? And so you have to consider your relationship with them. How long have you known them? What is the wedding style? But it, when it comes to the wedding party, I get the question a lot of, I've already spent so much money. How am I mm -hmm. also giving a gift? And mm -hmm. my response is, we don't wanna show up empty handed. So you want to bring a little something. You, maybe you do a group gift with the wedding party. And as the couple getting married, you need to understand that oftentimes you're expecting your wedding party to spend a lot on bachelor and bachelorette parties and showers and outfits and all these things. And so again, it's a lot more about the gesture than it is about the value when it comes to the, the wedding party. But it all goes back to considering really what your relationship was with that person, taking that time to think about what type of gift that you should be giving depending on the relationship. But again, you can't give, you can't give what you don't have. Right. And it's just, it's so nuanced now. It's so nuanced. It used to be, you know, look up the menu, cover your plate. There's the gift, but it, it doesn't work that way anymore. It's so true. It's so nuanced. And it's so, I feel like emotionally fraught for couples too, especially, you know, if you're traveling to attend the wedding and you're already forking out, you know, hundreds of dollars on flights and hotel and everything else, it really adds up. And it really does. Yeah. So, but I do think that those are really great guidelines to, to keep in mind when considering how much to give. And really to remember that it's about the gesture. Yeah, absolutely. Another question that I see all the time in these Facebook groups is, somebody didn't give us a gift or like we can't seem to find a card or you know something from this person that we really thought would give us one do i still send them a thank you card and what do i say is always the question that's that's a good one i would say yes send them a thank you card i always will recommend noting the specific gift in the thank you card so writing out what the gift that they gave you or the, the monetary gift, whatever it may be. But I would rather you just write a simple thank you for sharing our, our special day with us so that in case 
they did give you a gift and it was misplaced, you're kind of covering all of your bases. If it's someone that you're really, really close to, like a family member or your mom's sister or somebody, you could have, you know, your mom potentially ask because of course you want to make sure that the gift isn't missing somewhere. But if it's if it's someone who's a less close friend or you just don't want to deal with the drama, which is okay also, just send them a, a thank you note for joining you that evening. And if they didn't send you a gift, you took the high road. <laughs> send them a thank you note. <laughs> Absolutely. In some parts of the South, that could be seen as passive aggressive. <laughs> right. But, you know, it's like a cultural thing, right? Depending on the what area of the country you grew up in. It's so, it's fascinating. Human Humans are fascinating. <laughs> it is. And it really is. It is geographical and cultural. Absolutely. We love anything that can help make wedding planning more fun and less stressful. And that's why Greenvelope is a game changer. With over 8,000 five-star reviews, it's clear that so many people agree. Wedding announcements and invitations with Greenvelope are easy on your budget while sacrificing nothing when it comes to style or quality. They have thousands of beautiful designs for everything wedding-related, from engagement announcements to save the dates, formal wedding invitations, thank yous, and beyond. Plus, they have several key features that make communication with your invitees a breeze. Guests can RSVP with the click of a button, so you'll know in an instant who will or won't be attending. And you can even include survey questions to ask guests about meal preferences, accommodations, and more. One thing that I personally think sets Greenvelope apart, and something that really turns the stress way down, is that with every Greenvelope account, you have your very own messaging center. This makes sure that you're able to keep in contact with any of your guests at all times, whether you need to follow up, pivot your plans, or even ask for an extra hand. And while it's true that Weddings with Greenvelope save a lot of paper, the company takes their commitment to a sustainable future a step further, partnering with organizations like National Forest Foundation and being a proud member of 1% for the planet. So if you're planning your big day, there's really no need to wait. Visit Greenvelope today by going to greenvelope.com BSB or by visiting the link in the show notes. So this is one that... I see a lot and I want your answer and then I want also more of the history if you have it. So for like your actual ceremony and doing your processional, there's often a lot of questions on who should walk with who or what is the order? Do they have to stand when they get to the altar? Um, All of those things that have to do with that part of your ceremony. What are the guidelines there and and like how did they even come to be? The guidelines really came to be from the different houses of worship because the, the because weddings were usually typically a religious thing, right? It was <laughs> it had taken in a house of worship or um interfaith marriages were not as common back in the day, so you were getting married to someone, you know, of the same faith and so the guidelines came from what was customary in that house of worship. So before you are planning or while you're planning your wedding before your ceremony, you need to consider how can I be respectful of the house of worship if you're getting married in a religious place? So you speak to your officiant, you speak to the members of the church or temple or wherever you're getting married to learn about what that protocol is so you can be as respectful as you can there. If you are not getting married in the house of worship, there are no rules. (laughs) It's it's fair game, right? And so it really depends on, on your preference of do you want extended family to walk down the aisle? Maybe you just want you and your partner to be walking down the aisle. You may not be having a wedding party. You may have a wedding party, but you don't want them to stand up with you. And so in, in that case, it, it really depends on the couple's preference. But first and foremost, you want to make sure you're respecting the the way they do things in the place that you're getting married. So if you're not getting married in a place of worship, you should absolutely recreate the scene from The Office when they all dance down the aisle. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You do whatever you your heart desires. <laughs> I love it. So that was a lot of questions that we typically get and that we see. I would love to turn this to you and ask you for some of the most popular questions you hear and how to deal with them. So we, we touched on the, the biggest question that I usually get, which we touched on already, is the whole money thing, mm-hmm. right? Is do, can, do I have to invite my parents' friends or my aunt is paying for my dress. Does she get, you know, say over what I choose? And so that's a that's a big question. But I will also get questions about family members either not supporting your relationship or family members that you're on tough terms with. How do you go about communicating the fact that you're getting married? Do they get invited? 
How do you manage that? And again, I know I sound like a broken record, but there's no one size fits all. It, it really depends on your relationship with them. But I will say if, it, if you are in a position where someone is not supporting your relationship and they have been blatantly unsupportive and unkind, I don't care who they are. You do not need to extend an invitation to them because you want people in that room who love you and support you and any, anything else can stay at the door. Now, if you feel like they haven't been blatantly unsupportive, but you're just not sure what terms you are on with them and it would be the right thing to do for you and your family's sake to invite them, they can always say no, but at least you did the right thing. So that's a, that's a question I get is dealing with family members who you have prior issues with. You heard it here, folks. Weddings bring up so many like sensitive things and past, they, you know, reopen wounds and it's just a sensitive time. Oh yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> For anybody out there who is feeling pressured to include a family member who may be on the toxic side, let's say, Reference this episode. Send this to your mom as justification. An etiquette expert has given you permission to not invite that person. <laughs> oh goodness, they're going wedding. to come for me. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> they're going to come of for me. Not. <laughs> I give them permission too. They can come for me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's about like your peace and your enjoyment on that day. You don't want anything that's going to detract or distract from the purpose and the meaning behind the day. So I just love that and I completely agree with what you said. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that you said at least you did the right thing because I think that is also something that you can get tripped up on because the right thing implies that there is a one-size-fits-all thing, but there's not depending on, as you said, the relationship you have with this person and a million other factors that go into it. And by the right thing, it's really the right thing for your heart. Yes. Not for theirs, unfortunately. <laughs> Not for your parents. For you, as the person getting married, what sits right with you. And I will say that I, I definitely have worked through with a lot of couples very specific situations, right? Where I have all of the, the details and the background and then we kind of make a plan together of, of should they be invited? How do we how do we go about this? And so it it's really so nuanced. There's so many different situations. There's so many different layers. It truly <laughs> is layered like an onion though, isn't it? It really is. And then on on that topic about, you know, family drama, because that's really what, what comes up most often for me, people will also ask about, I come from a divorced parents, and this may be the first time that your parents or whomever is not speaking anymore is back in the same room. They both want to support you and you have a good relationship with both of them, but they don't have a great relationship with each other. Yeah. So how do you handle that as you know, you feel responsible for making sure that works as it's your wedding? And so I say you have a, a sit down, intentional private conversation with both of them. And you sit and say, listen, I know, right, we're acknowledging, I know that this isn't going to be easy for you to be in the same room. I get it. But then we say, this is a really, really big day for our entire family. So I would so appreciate if we can try and be as polite and respectful as possible. What can we do to make sure that you're as comfortable as possible? Can I seat you on the other side of the room? Can we make photos with the families at different times? Again, we're not bending over backwards and rerouting our entire schedule for them, but we're just acknowledging the fact that this is a difficult day for them. And we want them to know that we, we honor that and we'll do what we can to make them feel as comfortable as possible. Yeah, it's really nice to honor it with asking them what would help. The instinct is always going to be to come up yourself with things that will help and, and try to like prescribe, well, we'll do this, this and this, and that'll be good. But like, I think it feels extra sensitive and just caring to have somebody ask you what would be good for you in this situation and maybe you know it was always you were planning to have them sit on opposite sides of the room but if they have to then say that themselves it also like puts them in a situation where they're like okay I said that this is a stipulation that will help me show up my best on this day and it's like a reminder to them that that accommodation was made for them so they can act accordingly. It also makes them feel heard, which is yeah. most of the time what people want. Mm -hmm. They don't need the problem solved. They just want to be acknowledged and they want to feel heard. And that usually you could put out a lot of fires in your wedding planning drama 
with family by saying, I hear you, I understand, I want to work together on this, goes such a long way. Same with just talking to your partner. (laughs) 100%. 100%. (laughs) Like, is this a moment where you want me to come up with solutions or do you just want to yell and for me to yell with you? And either option is okay. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) So, okay. I think another one that you probably get all the time is the etiquette of timing for sending thank yous after a wedding has happened. I also see this a lot too. I think it's another situation where people are afraid that they'll be judged for like, you know, having bad manners or something like that, depending on when that happens. But it is also like kind of a big task to get all of that out if you have a big wedding. Yeah. What are the guidelines you suggest around that? First and foremost, you have to send them. I get flooded, (laughs) flooded with messages on Instagram about people saying, I was a guest at a wedding. I gave a very generous gift. I gave a shower gift. I gave an engagement gift. I never got one thank you note. And I'm appalled. I mean, (laughs) I I know I keep talking about I'm so modern. I'm so modern. But those are that's one of the traditions that I will always stand by. You have to write, especially with weddings, you have to write a thank you note. You must. So that's number one. And I will always say it's never too late. Life comes up, things happen. Um, so it's it's never too late to send one. You don't have to make the whole focus of the thank you note that you, so sorry, I'm so late. Just send it. It will be appreciated no matter when it comes. But if we're trying to follow a certain guideline, you know, normally with thank you notes, I try and have a within a week turnaround, but that's not feasible for for weddings. Again, because you are potentially writing hundreds. And so I would say, anywhere between two and six weeks, depending on when you're taking your honeymoon, you may be traveling for a while after your wedding, use that as a benchmark, but take a deep breath and know that you're not being, you know, held to that. But as long as they get done, take turns, you know, split them with your partner, make an event out of it, right? I always say like, put music on, pour a cup of coffee, like make it nice and and, and make it a thing that you'll look forward to. Because I know it's something that a lot of couples are dreading, especially after they've just spent who knows how long planning a wedding and they just want to be done at that (laughs) point. But you have to be, you have to acknowledge that that people spent their money and spent their time to celebrate you. They deserve a handwritten thank you. Yeah, it's so funny because it's just, again, it's like the product of the times, but like now people getting married are people that maybe wrote letters like in camp when they went to sleepaway camp or something, (laughs) right? But like since then, they've been texting and nobody, you know, is used to that. And I think the wedding is kind of the thing, like if, you know, if you do kind of the very normative stuff that happens after a wedding where, you know, you maybe start a family or anything like that, the wedding is the first thing where you have to start writing thank yous. And then it just kind of like doesn't end. You constantly have your kid's birthday parties or all these things. And then you are sending them all the time. But really like up until the wedding, maybe you had like, I don't know, like a graduation party or something, but often it's really like the first thing and certainly you and your partner like together sending these things and so it's a really good thing that a lot of invitation suites include a design for thank yous so like up front when you're doing that you have to kind of think about it and have that be a part of it so then you at least like you have them and you're like all right this has to happen well you bring up a really good point too because another question that i get asked a lot that, that that just made me think of is if people are sending gifts from your registry ahead of time between when you send out your save the dates and your wedding, do you have to send a thank you card? And I say yes, because you want people to know that the gift made it to you. Oh, look at you. <laughs> You're all prepared. See, you get an A+. Plus. <laughs> Need to go drop those off. <laughs> yeah, so perfect. You want you want people to be thanked as soon as they, they send you a gift. I'm such a big fan of like taking care of those things like as they come in too, so that they don't pile up into this like huge stack to tackle after the wedding and other things that you can do, I think to make it a little bit quicker or simpler is exporting your guest list addresses onto like labels and labeling all the outside of those cards. So when the time comes, you open it up, you write the note, put it right in and it's ready to go, you know? So you can do a lot of that kind of like prep work ahead of the wedding to save yourself time and batch it. Like Mariah said, make it a date with your partner, your, your new spouse and Just having it off your plate and knowing that you took care of it will be such a relief and it won't be hanging over your head for months to come after the wedding. That's a savvy hack. I love that. 
Also, it's a great tip. I have another hack. I have to share this. My sister for Hanukkah, she got me and my fiance this stamp. Oh, I and love so that. it's like, you know, our initials and then our address and it like looks all nice and fancy. I need to get one of those. <laughs> it is so cool. And and you know what? If you're listening to this and you need to get a gift for somebody getting married, yes. that is such a great idea. Seriously, shout out to my sister. Such a good idea. And we literally just stamp them. Done. It's a great gift. And it's it looks beautiful. We'll use I mean we'll use it even beyond the wedding, but like what a what a great gadget and such a thoughtful gift. It really is. So before we go, Mariah, can you share what are your top three pieces of advice for couples planning their wedding when it comes to etiquette? The first thing is that I want people to feel empowered and know that being considerate and having boundaries can coexist. So you can still have your vision and have your dream wedding while simultaneously being mindful and respectful of your guests' needs and your family's wants and everything like that. It's a, it's a juggling act, but it's possible. <laughs> the second thing is to be consistent when you're making decisions. So whether that comes to inviting children, plus ones, accommodations, wedding party details, when you make a decision with your partner, be consistent so that your guests feel valued and so that things are fair. And then the third thing is to make sure that you're communicating all of your expectations up front for your family, but also for your wedding party so that they can prepare accordingly and know what to expect in the coming months so there's no surprises time-wise, financially, or, or anything else like that. Perfect. I think we need to put being considerate and having boundaries can coexist. Can coexist. We should have yes. a t-shirt. A t-shirt, yes. a tote bag, I don't know. <laughs> a mug, a pen. Mug. We need it, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> this has been so awesome. There's really n- a never-ending list of questions that we could be asking. Um, and so I would love for you to share how people can get your book, What Do I Do?, so they can learn more about these questions that they will have, and then how they can even find you, maybe even connect with you. Give us a little bit of that. Sure. So my book is called What Do I Do? Every Wedding Etiquette Question Answered. And you can find it pretty much anywhere that you shop for books. So Amazon, Barnes Noble, Target, Walmart. And I am all over social media, wherever you are, at Old Soul Etiquette, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Mariah Grumet. And my website is oldsouletiquette.com. Perfect. It has been so lovely talking to you. I can't wait to dive into the book to, you know, just think through all the other questions that I have because it seems like every day there's another question. So what do I do, Mariah? Help right, me. I have the answers for you. <laughs> thank, thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Mariah, for being here and sharing all of these wonderful guidelines for etiquette for our listeners. And it's just been such a pleasure having you. You've been listening to The Bouquet Toss, brought to you by thebudgetsavvybride.com. For more tips, tricks, hacks, inspiration, and support, check out the links in our show notes. We are a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. Get more information and check out other shows in the network by visiting evergreenpodcasts.com.